hanging on the cross. Now, we're talking about the creator of all things, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him, and without Him, nothing was made that was made. Jesus created all things. Everything. He's hanging on the cross. His creation put Him on the cross, spits in His face, blasphemes and mocks Him, asks for a, a, a drink of water, says, I thirst, and they give Him sour vinegar. Yeah, mocking and mocking and mocking and scourging and wagging their heads at him and and uh, and he says, Father, forgive them for they know now what they do. Mm -hmm. Wow, you know, my mind immediately when I was studying uh, this topic of forgiveness, my mind took me to Joseph. I love the life of Joseph so much. We named our son Joseph, but you think about Joseph. You know, his brothers envied him. They, his brothers when they when his brothers uh, threw him in that pit. They were basically saying, that city's dead. We wish he died. So, so they come up with this plan to sell him, right? For 20 pieces of, of whatever, silver at that time. Uh, but uh, he ends up going to a foreign land. And, and then afterwards, his dreams all come true. By the way, we all know the stories. His brothers come. And uh, let, me, let me read this here to you, Genesis 50, because I don't want to mess it up. Genesis 50, verse 18, and his brethren also went and fell down before his face. And they said, behold, we be thy servants. That's when he manifested himself to them. That's when he said, hey, I'm Joseph, your brother. Then they're like, we're dead. <laughs> we're dead. This guy's in, in charge of all of Egypt. And Joseph said unto them, now pay attention to this, fear not. He didn't remind them of what they did to him. He said, fear not. For am I in the place of God? But as for you, ye all thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring the pass as it is this day to save much people alive. How did he save much people alive? Well, God gave him the wisdom during that seven years of famine, the seven years of hard times for him to gather up much food, right? All the world ended up coming to Egypt for, for corn. Now, therefore, fear ye not. He tells them again, fear not. I can only imagine if he had to tell them twice, they were panicking, shaking, thinking we're dead. He's going to kill us. He says, I will nourish you. Is that something you say to someone that tried to kill you? <laughs> they tried to kill him. They took him away from his dad. They took him away from his brother Benjamin. They took him away from, from his life. Right? They sold him into slavery. And he says, I will nourish you. And your little ones. I haven't seen, I haven't seen my nephews or my nieces. Basically is what he's saying, but I'm going to nourish them. I'm going to love on them. And he says this, and he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. Now that is the complete opposite of what the world would do, right? The world would say, <laughs> an eye for an eye and a two for a two. You tried to sell me out. Oh boy, now I'm in charge and I got all these soldiers and I got all these Egyptians. I got a big, big gang right now, buddy. I'm coming after you and your family. But no, he nourished them, told them fear not, spoke kindly unto them and loved on them. That's the ultimate act of forgiveness. Amen. Does anyone need an outline this morning? Need an outline? You got it, Sister Lupita? I'm praying for your eye surgery, Sister Lupita. Amen. You're a blessing. Sister Brenda, I'm praying for your heart surgery. Amen. I know that's coming up. All right, introduction. Let's uh, let's go ahead and open up our Bibles to Ephesians chapter four, if you will. Ephesians chapter four. I know I got off a of track as I always do. Ephesians chapter four, verses twenty-six through thirty-two is our text. Ephesians chapter four, verses twenty-six through thirty-two. The Bible says this: "Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath." Now, for those of you who are married, this is a good verse for us. Amen. You say, why? Because your spouse is always going to do something that makes you cringe. But you say, you say, are you sharing your problems with us? There's no such thing as a perfect marriage. Amen. I love my wife and she loves me. But listen, there's no such thing as a perfect marriage. So we have to learn to deal with not going to sleep angry. Right. You say, why? Because then you can give place to the devil. In verse 27, it says, neither give place to the devil. Now, how do you give place to the devil when you go to sleep angry? 
You see, those two verses, is, God, the Holy Spirit didn't make a mistake by putting those two verses side by side. You want to give place to the devil. You want the devils to come into your house. You want the devils to, to uh, torment you. You say, but I'm a Christian. He who's in us is greater than he who's in the world. Yeah, you cannot be possessed with the devil, but you can be oppressed by the devils. How? If you harbor bitterness, anger in your heart, mm -hmm. and you keep it there. It can ruin homes, right? It says, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needed. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Now, verse 29 and verse 26 also go hand in hand. You say, how? Because if you're angry then corrupt communication is going to flow out of your mouth. Amen? Yes. That's why, that's why we need to be filled with the Spirit. And the Bible says this in verse 30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Now, if, if corrupt communication is coming out of our mouth, if we're harboring bitterness and anger, then we're going to grieve God's Holy Spirit. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away with you with all malice. And be ye, here's Joseph, kind one to another. Here's Jesus, kind one to another. Tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. Let me read these verses here in Psalm chapter 103. He, God hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Can you imagine if God gives us what we deserve? <laughs> what we, we'd all be dead, right? <laughs> For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is His mercy toward them that fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. Like a, as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear Him. For he knoweth our frame, and he remembereth that we are dust. God knows that we're messed up, right? That's exactly why God's mercy is so great towards us. Amen. Introduction on the lesson of forgiveness. We have been learning through the series that the most important quality of structure is the foundation. Likewise, our lives are designed to need a solid foundation. Deep inside all of us is where no one else sees except for God. And those are the areas and the points that matter the most. In this lesson, we'll be discussing an area essential to a strong Christian's life, as well as strong relationships, the act of forgiveness. Do you want to have strong relationships? You have to practice forgiveness. You want to have no friends at all? Then harbor bitterness and grudges in your heart, and all of your friends are going to run away from you. Your spouse, your children, no one's going to want to be around you, right? Uh, let me give you this illustration. Jim and Elizabeth Elliot were missionaries to a, a tribal place in the, uh, in, as known as the Aka Indians. Uh, Y'all remember Jim and Elizabeth Elliot, right? You know Pastor Gibbs and many, many people speak of, of these missionaries. After a seemingly friendly first contact with several of the Indians, Jim and four other missionaries were speared to death. To many people's surprise, Elizabeth and her 10-month-old daughter returned to the tribe to live with them and eventually ended up winning many of the Aka people to the Lord Jesus Christ. You think about that, the ultimate act of forgiveness. Now, she could have she could have very easily stayed in the States and said, you know, <laughs> I, I hope that the Lord brings fire and brimstone down upon those Indians. Remember Jonah? Remember when, when the Lord told him to go to Nineveh and told those people to repent? What did Jonah do? Jonah hated those Ninevites, right? Because they were against the Hebrews. So what did he do? He wanted to go the opposite side of Tarshish. But the Lord said, no, no, no. You're going to go there and you're going to tell them to repent. And many of them ended up turning, repenting, right? Giving their lives over to God. And God ended up sparing that land. And as a result of that, the prophet Jonah was bitter and upset. He knew that God was merciful, right? Remember when he was sitting under that gourd tree there? And uh, he was worried about the, the, the gourd, basically that, that insect eating the gourd there, instead of the actual people, 
right? God wanted him to, God wanted, uh, I'm sorry, Jonah wanted God to destroy those people. When you think about Elizabeth Elliot, she thought about those people. She thought about how the Lord had put into the heart of her husband, into the heart of her, to go there and to, and to try to lead those people to Christ. And then even though her husband and four other missionaries got speared to death, she ended up returning there with her daughter. Now, she even took her 10-month-old daughter there. Wow. I mean, talk, talk about faith. Amen. She took her 10-month-old daughter there, really, you know, understanding that her life is in the Lord's hands. Let me give you a first fill in the blank here. Number one, I appreciate Brother Danny. It's such a blessing. He types in the uh, fill in the blanks there on our, uh, on our outlines. Reject Satan's temptation. Satan wants, I love, I loved Pastor Hetzer's message on Thursday night. How many of you are here Thursday night listening to that message? Uh, the gate of hell, entitled the gate of hell. Now, what is, what is Satan trying to do? How is Satan trying to burn the world? with our words, right? We'll, we'll get to that. But Satan's trying to tempt the whole world into destroying each other, right? Remember, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So our problem isn't with our spouse. Our problem isn't, isn't with our pastor. Our problem isn't with our neighbor. Our problem isn't with our boss. Our problem is with principalities and powers, spiritual wickedness in high places, right? What we uh, reject Satan's temptation, what we do, what do we do when someone has hurt us? The first thing we do is determine what we wouldn't do, yield to Satan's temptation. The devil has many darts and arrows that he will shoot at us. And one of his favorites is the arrow of a hurt spirit. Now, um, I don't know if it's okay or not, but if I can mention Brother Jonathan's cousin, because you sent it out in a text message, and I'm not saying he didn't have forgiveness in his heart, and I'm not trying to use him, I apologize. But uh, when something happens and someone is hurt, mm -hmm. then that person can try to do the extreme to themselves and to others. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. Remember, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Yes, he is. Right? Jesus wants us to be united, not divided. Right. Satan's main job of trying to bring temptation into our life is to harm ourselves, mm -hmm. to harm our families, and to harm others. Mm -hmm. And listen, he's been doing a really good job at it. Why? Because oftentimes what we do is we give him place. You see, Satan has certain jurisdiction. Did y'all know that? Certain jurisdiction. For instance, right now, I believe we're in the jurisdiction of maybe the sheriff. The El Cajon Police Department can't come here and get involved in the matters of what's going on around here. It's the same thing with the devil. The devil needs permission for him to come in and to hurt you or to harm you. Now, he's going to try to come and tempt you always. But if you don't give him place, then he's going to end up fleeing and leaving. He has jurisdiction, right? But if you're constantly listen, watching horror movies and you're watching pornography and you have all kinds of uh, drugs and paraphernalia in your house, you're listening to heavy metal and rock and roll music, guess what you're doing? You're saying you're opening the doors wide open and you're saying devils, not just devil, devils, come on in. This place is a nice, comfortable place for you all, yeah. right? But if the home is full of beautiful worship songs mm -hmm. and Bible and mm -hmm. forgiveness and speaking edification to your spouse and love and peace. Do you think the devil's going to want to be in an atmosphere like that? No. You're not giving him place. Yeah. So guess what? He's going to flee away. Yeah. He's going to go to the next door neighbor's house mm -hmm. that constantly has the fighting and arguing and drugs and, and pornography and all kinds of wickedness, right? right? That's where the devils like to live. So reject Satan's temptation. Let me give you A. To sin in anger. To sin in anger. Ephesians 4.26 says, Be ye angry and sin not. You say, well, Jesus got angry. Remember when he went into the temple and he was whipping and, oh. and turning over the tables and the money changers there. and He had a righteous indignation. You see, you and I, when we get angry, oftentimes it's going to lead to sin. You say, why? Because... Oftentimes when we get angry, we're not getting angry over righteous things, right? Most of the time, not all the time. When that moment of hurt comes, our natural reaction is to respond in anger. This response, however, uh, only adds damage to the situation. James chapter 1 verse 20, For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. 
It is true that there are some instances in which anger is righteous. Even Jesus demonstrated this anger several times. Mark chapter 3, verse 5. And when he, Jesus, had looked round about them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he saith unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. So the, the Pharisees and Sanhedrin constantly sat back, they ate their popcorn, if you will, and they were always had a magnifying glass on Jesus to see, to try to make him stumble into sin. But they couldn't find anything because Jesus was perfect. The only thing they found against him was that he would heal on the Sabbath. Y'all remember that? Yeah. He constantly do miracles and things on the Sabbath, but he said, he said he's the Lord of the Sabbath. Amen. Mm. Jesus' anger, however, was always perfected directly at sin, not with sin. And it caused him to uphold righteousness. Isaiah 53, 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Wow. Let me give you B. To stay in anger. To stay in anger. Satan not only wants us to get angry with someone, but he wants us to stay angry for the rest of our lives. This is why God commands us to not allow anger to linger in our hearts. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. What does that mean? That means if you have an ought with someone or a problem with someone, try the best you can to break your pride, right? Because oftentimes we got too much pride to go say sorry. Or we got too much pride, even though that person is wrong and we're right, for us to be able to go and try to reconcile. Break your pride. Because remember, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to who? The humble, right? Humble yourselves humble. in the mighty hand of uh, in the mighty. Uh, humble yourselves in the sight of God and he will uh, lift you up. Uh, wrath is defined as intense anger. It often has an idea of vengeance behind it. So the world constantly wants to remember an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Vengeance is mine, right? But the Lord said, no, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Mm -hmm. Never be too proud to do whatever is necessary to not end the day with discord in your home or in your relationships. When we make it our habit to go to bed angry, there's no limit to the intense things we may do. When we allow anger to seethe within us, it will boil over in so many other ways. God wants us to address problems graciously instead of harboring hurts and bitterness in our hearts. If, uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15 says, Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Do you want to defile yourselves? Harbor bitterness in your hearts. Perfect example, David and Saul. Y'all remember that? Remember how... Uh, how the women came, remember in, in uh, 1 Samuel 17, when David goes uh, to the battle, Goliath was there blaspheming the God and blaspheming the people of God. David goes and takes that Goliath out. The women end up singing, David, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Saul has slain his thousands, but David is what? 10,000. His 10,000. So now Saul being king steps back and says, wait a second, who does this guy think he is? So he gets bitter towards David, right? And the Bible says that he had a javelin basically at his hand, and he threw that javelin trying to kill David. Now, how many opportunities did David have to kill Saul? But he never did. Remember that time that he was in the cave? Yeah. Saul was in the cave sleeping, and he cut that the side of his skirt there, yeah. and he even lifted it up and showed him, listen, I could have killed you, man, yeah. but I didn't, right? Because I fear God, right? So the ultimate act of forgiveness, David constantly was, and, and so many times the Bible says in 1 Samuel uh, 18, that David behaved himself wisely. What does that mean, David behaved himself wisely? He didn't, he didn't uh, repay evil for evil. He repaid evil for good. Remember, Saul even gave him his daughter to be, uh, uh, there's, there's a word that the Bible uses, to be like an affliction to him. Mm -hmm. Y'all remember that? Yeah. Uh, his daughter was going to be a, a really bad thing for him. But, uh, but David said, who am I for me to, I'm basically a shepherd guy, who am I to be able to receive the king's daughter? I'm a nobody. 
humbling himself down. And that's exactly why God took the kingdom. Remember when Samuel went to Saul and said, God's going to rent the kingdom from you. And who's he going to give it to? He's going to give it to the guy that you hate. Uh -huh. He's going to give it to the guy that you're bitter against. You know what that reminds me of? If you're bitter and you're harboring something in your heart, God can take all of your possessions and give them to that person. Uh -huh. Let's not <laughs> practice harboring bitterness in our hearts. Amen. Jesus was the ultimate act of forgiveness, the ultimate act of mercy. And, be, and, and I love that verse, how it says, being tender-hearted one to another. Uh, let me give you number two here. Number two, reflect biblical grace. When someone wrongs us, this is our opportunity to receive the grace of God and to respond to them with, with grace. Ephesians 4 notes two ways in which we can respond to grace. A, with our actions. In our actions, let's respond with grace. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good. Now here's, here's the actions that he may have to give to him that needed. Right? That person, the person that used to steal is going to repent and no longer steal. Now they're going to labor and work with their hands. Now they're actually going to put their hand in their pocket, the hard work money, and they're going to give to them that are in need. That's the actions, right? At first glance, it may seem that Ephesians 4.28 is unrelated to the rest of the passage. And yet, the verses above and after deal with relationships and responding to others when wrong. This verse is not unrelated at all. Let's look at it more closely. Notice the multiple actions that are mentioned in Ephesians 4.28. No more stealing, labor, work, and give. Responding correctly to the difficulties or offenses that are a part of our life will be seen through our actions. God is telling us to reject allowing anger to have its way to harbor bitterness in our hearts. Properly, biblically, properly and biblically deal with that anger and that will change the way that we live. Let me give you B. In our words. In our words. Perhaps... That, uh, perhaps the area in which we struggle to respond, perhaps the area in which we most struggle to respond with grace is that of words that can hurt others. Now, this is exactly why I mentioned pastor's message on Thursday. If you didn't listen to it, please go back and listen to that message. It was phenomenal. Uh, speaking about James uh, and how, uh, let me not butcher these verses. Look at, there's a verse in there. That we can miss. James chapter 3. Right after Hebrews. I got a new Bible so my pages stick stick here. Uh, the Bible says this. Uh, James chapter 3. The Bible says this in verse 7. For every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of the things of the sea is tamed and hath been tamed by mankind. Now you think about that for a second. You, you go to the circus. You see lions and tigers. Lions are king of the jungle. And what are they? To some kind of point, they're tamed, right? You go to SeaWorld, you check out the killer whale. Those things are huge. The orcas, those are the ones that kill, kill the great whites. Those are the ones that, that kill the humpback whales. The killer whales are no joke, and they're tamed to a certain point, right? You think about king cobras. You got snake handlers, one of the most poisonous snakes on the planet, and you have someone that's kind of sort of tamed it. Now, the Bible's true when it says every beast of the field has been tamed and is tamed. Now, watch this. Verse 8. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. You say, so if all these beasts have been tamed and are tamed, but the tongue can no man tame, how in the world is the Bible telling me to protect and to tame my tongue? To watch what my words say. It's not my fault. It's just the sinful nature that's in me. No man can tame the tongue, but the Holy Spirit can tame the tongue. Y'all understand that? See, no man being in the flesh can tame the tongue. You see, when you're full of the flesh, all kinds of wickedness is going to come out of your mouth. You're going to slander. You're going to backbite. You're going to complain, right? I love that worship song we sang this morning. You're going to do completely opposite of give thanks. You're going to break others down when you, should, when you should be edifying. But when you're filled with the Spirit, now you're allowing the Holy Spirit to take control of your vessel, 
to take control of your life. So the Holy Spirit is going to, going to put a filter, if you will, upon your mouth. Y'all see how that works? Amen? So one way that we can minister grace unto others is with our words. Uh, Ephesians 4.29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But that which is good to the use of edifying, let it, let it may, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. God the Father, when Jesus, his son, was upon this earth, there were multiple times when Jesus got baptized, the heavens opened. This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. What was God the Father doing? Did God the Father need to say that? He didn't need to say that, but he did it. Everything I believe this, everything that's written in this book and everything that was done by God and by, by the prophets or whatever, the Holy Spirit pinned it down for us, right? For us to be able to, to see, for us to be able to, to see the examples of what not to do and for us what to do. God the Father was speaking edification into his son. Now, did he need to do that? He didn't need to do that because Jesus was 100% God, 100% man. But he did it just basically to show us, with my words, I'm showing my son that I love him. And that's exactly what I try to do with my children. When my son Joseph messes up, I try to show him the things that he did that he messed up. I don't go and break him down. How come you can't be like, like Sean? Or how come like you can't be like the other boys? No, I don't, I don't do that. He's not like the other boys. Amen. He's Joseph. He's the way that God created him. He's going to mess up. So what do I try to do? I try to edify him and try to lift him up and say, son, you did this wrong over here, but we're going to work on that. Let's fix that by doing this, this, and this. Son, I'm so proud of you. Elia, I'm so proud of you, sweetheart. Noor, I'm so proud of you. Thank you so much for the house looks beautiful. You look beautiful. What am I doing? I'm speaking edification. Edification means to build up, right? Now with our words, on the other hand, can we easily break people down? Yes. And we can destroy families, destroy churches. We can destroy everything with this little, how many inch tongue do we have? Right? It can burn, it can burn big time uh, with our words. So let's, let's be careful with our words. Go back if you didn't listen to Thursday's message by pastor, please. And listen to that. It will it will definitely, definitely help you out. Let me give you number three. Number three. Refuse to grieve the Holy Spirit. Refuse to grieve the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4.30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. What does that mean, sealed? The Holy Spirit's in you. He's sealed in you. He's not. Once you're saved, you're saved. Amen. We don't believe that you can lose your salvation. So now we need to be careful how we live our lives. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. What, is it, what does grieve mean? To break his heart. Don't hurt him, right? Uh, to be honest, we probably do not take into consideration the Holy Spirit's presence with us as much as we ought. And yet, he will never leave us. He has sealed us unto the day of redemption. Because he is always with us, we should be careful that none of our actions cause him to be sorrowful or offensive. Ephesians 4.30 tells us that we bring grief, sorrow, or heaviness to the Holy Spirit when we refuse to forgive. Verse 31 further describes what specifically grieves Him. A. Bitterness. Bitterness grieves God. If you're harboring bitterness in your heart, why should God hear you? In fact, uh, let me see if I could find this verse. Remember the Sermon on the Mount with Jesus? Matthew chapter 6, I'm watching your time here, We're, we need to get through this. Matthew chapter 6, the Bible says this, Jesus is teaching them how to pray, and he says this in verse, uh, verse 14. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you your trespasses. Isn't that powerful? If you harbor bitterness in your heart and you, you refuse not to let it go, the Bible says that God's not going to forgive your sins. Wow. That's, that's pretty powerful. Uh, bitterness grieves God. Let me give you B. Sinful speech grieves God. Let all clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. While the first three sins relate primarily on how we feel, 
These last three relate primarily to what we say. Clamor means a great outcry, to utter loud and noises repeatedly. Evil speaking means to slander uh, someone, to, to, uh, to blaspheme someone else's name. Malice means all that is sinful. Do you notice the, pro the process that is being exposed in Ephesians 4.31? The issue begins in the heart as bitterness. So when you have bitterness in your heart and you're full of the flesh, all kinds of wickedness is going to come out. Let me give you four. Four, reflect the Savior's forgiveness. Praise God for the Savior's forgiveness. Amen. God doesn't tell us what not to do. He gives us the perfect remedy for bitterness, choosing forgiveness. We usually think the perfect remedy is choosing to get even. Thus, God reminds us not to get even, but to overcome evil with good. Let me give you A, under Reflect the Savior's Forgiveness. We serve a kind Savior. Sometimes we forget the kindness of God, yet He shows it to us every day. Even when we fail to notice it or thank Him for it, God is constantly having mercy and grace over us. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted. Who does that sound like? God. He's kind towards us. He's tenderhearted towards us. Amen? Let me give you B. We serve a forgiving Savior. We serve a forgiving Savior. Ephesians 4, 32, Forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Forgiving means to give grace or to pardon. To give grace or to pardon. Really, really quickly, Matthew 18, Matthew 18. Really quickly, Matthew 18. Matthew 18, verse 21. Peter comes to Jesus and said, Lord, how oft should I forgive my brother if he trespass against me? And I forgive him. Till seven times? Jesus saith unto him, I say not until seven times, but seven until seventy times seven. Therefore... Uh, Matthew 18, verse 23. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take accounts of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought to him, unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents, basically a lifetime of wages. But for as much as he had not to pay, his work commanded him to be sold, and his wife and his children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion, and loosed him and forgave him all of his debt. Listen, that's exactly like Jesus. We owe him a lifetime of debt, and he just pardons us. He forgives us. Now watch what happens. Verse 28. But the same servant that got forgiven went out, and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. Pence at that time was the lowest denomination. He owed him a hundred pennies, basically nothing. And he laid hands on him, and he took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, and went and cast him into prison, till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry, and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee of all that debt, because thou desirest me. Shouldest not that thou uh, have done, have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors, that he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto thee, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one of his brother their trespasses." Wow, y'all see that story there? God has forgiven us of so, so, so much. When someone wrongs us of little, shouldn't we forgive them? Amen. That's the, the, the main uh, purpose there of the story. Amen. The main topic of the story. God bless you all, Brother Dan. You want to come up and close us, brother? Thank you for your patience. I know we went a little long.